What are you doing here? Oh, I'm just stuck for a walk, mate. Oh, come on. Yeah, yeah, give us your money. Right, money. Give us your wallet. I don't have come any on. money. Get him, put him on the ground. Come on, give it up, Paul. Stop Take that, you big bag. Oh, oh you mince and prick. What is that? What is that? What is that? Take that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, you're a fucker. Cool again tomorrow with the heavier rain clearing down south. The In 1988, Ross Warren is 25 years old and a favourite of TV audiences in Wollongong, south of Sydney, where he presents news and weather reports on Win TV. Good afternoon, I'm Ross Warren. Oh, very soft. Um, lovely person, just yeah, wore his heart on his sleeve, joker, Lo oh, I love to knock around on camera, or even off camera, like the red nose days, and he'd be the first with the, the red nose on and find out later whether he was allowed to wear it or not, but he'd have it. <laughs> Wollongong's own resident weatherman, Ross Warren. Hi, Ross. And that was Ross Warren. He was keen to try things. He Next loved to be a larrikin on air. Next, Brian Henderson presents all the latest in National Nine News. And he had this spontaneous smile, these bright eyes, good-looking, slim, trendy, always had that sort of college boy next-door look and had the most delightful personality, so that he'd light up a room. Ross Warren's ready smile and larrikin humour have been noticed by network programmers in Sydney, and he's now ready to make the move to the big time. And in those days, the ultimate was to go to Sydney and become a national personality, and that's what Ross had his sights set on. While he has a high public profile, Ross's private life is just that, private. He's gay, but it's the 1980s. Although homosexuality has now been decriminalised in New South Wales, prejudice is still widespread. Um, I think he may have been a little guarded at times because of his position with television. Um, it was back in the 80s, of course, so there was still a lot of homophobia around. Um, and I think he had to look after himself in that regard. I guess being in the public eye, you do like to have a little bit of your life uh, that nobody knows about. But in Ross's case, he definitely kept it hidden. And again in those days, and I think probably uh, to a lesser extent today, but it still goes on, it, your sexuality, unfortunately, you are judged often in our business. On weekends, Ross often drives north to Sydney, where he can relax anonymously in the gay scene and be himself. On Friday, the 21st of July, 1989, he sets off for just such a weekend. He'll be staying, as usual, with a good mate, Craig Ellis, at a house in the inner city suburb of Redfern. He had a few few mates up here in Sydney, but um, because he had travelled around a lot, lived in a few different places, he, he didn't have a, a, a big ne network of friends. But um, yeah, we, we, I was probably one of his closest friends, I think. After leaving his luggage at Craig's place, Ross heads for the gay bars of Oxford Street, where he's arranged to meet up with a workmate named Philip. Ross wasn't a wasn't a, a big drinker. He wasn't um, somebody what we'd call now a binge drinker. Uh, he would have a few drinks. He would usually break up those beers or those um, spirits with uh, with mineral water. About two a.m., Ross says good night to Philip and drives off. As Philip was driving away, he noticed that uh, instead of turning right back towards the, the Redfern area, Ross was in fact going left in the direction of Bondi. At that time he thought that was um, strange because uh, Ross had made no mention of going anywhere else. In fact he'd said he was going straight home, he was tired. So he did make a note of that but then just dismissed it.
Arriving at the end of Bondi Beach, Ross parks his car and walks into Mark's Park. At night, this park is well known as a beat, a secluded place where homosexual men meet. Here, in the early hours of Saturday morning, this lonely young man with the secret life hopes to find, in the darkness, another like himself. Mark's Park is, uh, has, has been a gay beat for probably um, 60 or 70 years. There have been records of it being uh, a place um, where uh, men have met for, for sex, casual sex, uh, dating back to the 1930s. It now attracts hundreds and hundreds of people, people on, uh, on a good sunny weekend. And it's, uh, it's one of uh, Sydney's tourist attractions. And, uh, at, but at night, it's, it's quite a different place. It takes on a, a very different atmosphere at night. Ross walks into the darkness, never to be seen again. He, yeah, he didn't turn up the next morning and we were a little concerned um, because it wasn't in his nature to um, stay out. Um, but, you know, we thought possibly he'd met someone and hooked up with them and, and gone back to their place. So we, we were a little concerned, um, but this was back in the days before, you know, friends kept in touch with mobile phones and, you know, he it wasn't completely out of, out of the question that he might have stayed out and, um, and not let us know what was happening. It's not until later on Saturday, when he'd arranged to meet up with friends, that they're certain something is wrong. He was uh, rarely, if ever, late. And if he was running late, he would always give the courtesy of letting people know that he was running late. Um, and he was going to meet up with us, myself and a group of friends, um, on Oxford Street, outside of the Oxford on Taylor Square, as I recall, um, around 11 p.m. Um, so. I know we were there and we waited for quite some time, several frantic phone calls, well, not, not so much frantic phone calls at that stage, but several phone calls uh, went unanswered. By late on Sunday afternoon, when Ross fails to arrive back in Wollongong to read the Sunday night news bulletin, Craig goes to the police. Now it's 48 hours or whatever and uh, the guy hasn't turned up and you know, tried to see if there was some, something more they could do. Um, and I think at, at that time they um, asked us some questions and made some notes, but they, they didn't really show any sign of doing anything about it. Craig and his partner Paul fill out a missing persons report. They then decide to do some sleuthing for themselves. And after hearing from Philip that Ross headed east on Friday night, they drive out to Bondi. And we turned up at Mark's Park and um, his car was parked up the top of the cliffs. So as soon as we caught, saw his car on, on that Sunday evening, that's when, again, we really thought, well, something, something's not right here. In Queensland, Ross's mother tries to call her son at Wind TV and she's told he hasn't turned up for work. The next day, she contacts police and hears that his car's been found. She and Ross's father immediately make plans to fly to Sydney. On Monday, Craig and Paul return to Bondi. I think we probably called the police in the morning and said, what, what happens now? And they said, well, you know. They didn't, they didn't really say that they were going to do a lot, so we thought, well, we'll, we'll go and have a look and see if, if we can find something. They begin knocking on doors of nearby residents, but no one has seen their friend. They search Mark's Park and the surrounding area. Walked around the top of the cliffs to see if we could see anything and couldn't find anything. And then I think just as we were about to leave, we saw something shining um, down at the bottom of the, the cliffs, um, sitting on the rocks. And so we, we found a way to get down to the bottom of the, of the cliff and. Uh, and found that this was actually Ross's keys, just popped into a, um, underneath the, the lip of a, of a ledge. Craig reports the discovery of the keys, and police then begin searching the area and interviewing local residents. Newspapers and TV news bulletins are soon running with reports that Ross Warren is missing. 
the fact that a, a person with a profile had disappeared under such mysterious circumstances fueled quite a, a quite a media frenzy. His boss at Win TV News tells reporters that it's the first time in four years that Ross has failed to turn up for work. Friends declare Ross had been happy and looking forward to new career opportunities in Sydney. And they confirm that his disappearance is totally out of character. You don't have somebody busily working on their showreel getting ready to, with the possibility of earning, not only of, of being seen nationally, but earning a little bit more money as well. You don't have somebody spending their time doing that when they're suddenly going to either stage their disappearance or, heaven forbid, take their own life. Hello, I'm Jane Singleton and this is a toothpaste commercial. When he went missing though, well, it was... Everybody was, you know, saying, oh, he's got to have done himself. No way. There's absolutely no way that boy would have harmed himself. Uh, they did a total fingerprinting of, the, of his apartment. Uh, it was dusted uh, from top to bottom. They did a forensics. It was um, a, a much more um, professional uh, investigation of a crime scene or potential crime scene than, uh, than was the case in Sydney where they had cars, keys as evidence. A check of Ross's bank accounts showed that they've not been accessed. Police then closed the file and the Ross Warren case is left in limbo. In the winter of 1989, television newsreader Ross Warren disappears from a clifftop park near Sydney's famous Bondi Beach. It's now May 2000, more than 10 years later, and the eyes of the world are about to turn on Sydney as host of the Olympic Games. In his office at Paddington Police Station in Sydney's eastern suburbs, Detective Stephen Page picks up a file marked Ross Warren. On the top is an emotional letter from Ross Warren's mother, Kay, pleading for police to close the case and admit her son is dead. And she hadn't had any um, coronial inquest, no finding of, uh, finding of death, no death certificate, and she wanted to put his, um, you know, his matters to rest, try and get some, um, some degree of closure. But when I saw her letter, um, she'd attached to it numerous other letters where she'd made similar pleas. You had the feel of a frustrated um, mother, um, and I felt for her. I suppose I made a commitment then and there to, um, you know, there'd be no more letter writing from Kay Warren that we'd, we'd start something off and we'd, we'd give her closure of, uh, of that matter. The detective is intrigued to find that Ross Warren's death is officially regarded as accidental and his file had simply been closed. It's not even been sent to the missing persons unit. From the, the documents that I've read, initial police beliefs were that, um, you know, perhaps he was there and he's, um, you know, slipped or fallen off the, um, you know, off the, the, um, the cliff and gone out to sea and it was a, um, basically a non-suspicious death. It was just an accident. As Detective Sergeant Page delves further into the Ross Warren file, he notices a number of errors and anomalies. The more he reads, the more his suspicions are aroused. But at this point, 10 years after the event, if he's going to find out anything useful, he's going to have to start from scratch. Um, there'd never been a brief of evidence prepared for, um, for the coroner. In, uh, in relation to his death. So with that, there's no statements available. Um, it, was, um, it was almost as if I was starting the investigation afresh. There was nothing to, um, there was nothing to run with. It wasn't a, um, a fresh homicide where you had uh, physical evidence, you had witnesses, you had motives, you had suspects, you know, in the, uh, in the early days. I really had to uh, fight hard. The detective wonders why basic police procedures have not been followed. Why, for example, were Ross's keys and his car not fingerprinted? 
Certainly there probably could have been a little bit more that, um, that could have been done with the, uh, you know, with the Ross Warren uh, investigation as far as interviewing locals, you know, statements from police, canvassing, uh, you know, witnesses and, rel and you know, uh, residents of the, um, of the area. The detective decides to seek out police officers who worked on the original Ross Warren investigation. But this creates even more questions. Several of those listed as having worked on the case tell him they had little or no involvement. Page now expands his inquiries and suddenly comes across details of another mysterious death of a gay man. John Allen Russell at the same location and around the same time. John Russell is Bondi born and bred. The streets of Bondi are John's world and he's well known and liked by the locals. He was just well, very open and happy. He used to enjoy life. Had a very big circle of friends and used to uh, enjoy their company as well. As he matures, John realises he's gay. And after leaving school, he takes on casual work as a barman. Not just gay clubs in on Oxford Street that he worked in over the years, but um, various um, venues in, in the city and at Bondi. He um, was um, a low-key... Um, not a not a person given to depression or or moods. He was uh, very he was popular. He had lots of mates and uh, a very loving family. Well, Johnny was just one of those bright sparks that you know, everybody likes. He's just uh, he sort of oozed laughter. You know? Loved to joke, loved to laugh, and well, they shout people. You know? Just a people's person. John is 31 when he inherits $100,000 from his grandfather and he immediately makes plans to leave Bondi. He intends to build a home on land his father owns at Wollombi, north of Sydney. He's excited about the move and in November 1989 begins packing up and saying goodbye to friends. Yeah, all right, see ya. Bye. On the night of November 22nd, 1989, John has a few farewell drinks at the Bondi Hotel with one of his closest mates. Got to the point where it was about half past ten or whatever and um, I called it quits and said, right, I'll see you tomorrow. And for him to get back to Peter's new flat would have been 800 yards to the north. Um, I just uh, left and said goodbye and see you tomorrow night. Now, John, being a Bondi boy, he knew it was a beat. He wasn't uh, a great patron of beats. He'd occasionally been to them, but it was by no means a regular pastime of his. Uh, for reasons that we perhaps will never know, whether it was just uh, a very warm, balmy evening, a few beers in his belly, whatever, a kind of maybe his own kind of way of saying goodbye to Bondi, he walked to the headland. It is just three months since Ross Warren disappeared from the same area. G'day, mate. What's hey. going on? Not much, mate. What are you doing? I want your wallet. <laughs> You're kidding, aren't you, mate? <laughs> no, mate. I'm not your dirty cook. You have him before I give you a flogging. <laughs> morning a local resident is out jogging when he sees a bloodied body lying on the rock shelf after checking the pulse he runs to a nearby building site and calls the police 
Near the body, they find a cigarette pack containing John Russell's key card. The next morning, John's brother Peter is taken by police to the morgue to identify the body. My first immediate reaction, and everybody I know's immediate reaction, was this isn't suicide. You know, you're about to come into $100,000. You're about to, you've got plans, you're going to do this, you're going to do that, you're going to go on a holiday to Queensland, you've got all these other things you're going to do. You don't go and jump off a park, off the rocks at Mark Park, Mark's Park and kill yourself. I knocked on the door at uh, Oakley Road and was informed in the doorway that John was dead. So uh, a bit upset, of course, and uh, then we started or I started trying to find out what was going on, uh, what was happening, what uh, was happening with investigations, and we went down to the uh, Bondi Police Station, and uh, they told us virtually nothing. Reading the reports of John's death 10 years later, Steve Page is intrigued by the extensive nature of the injuries. John had suffered a fractured skull, ribs, and clavicle broken arms and legs and extensive abrasions. He also had a torn lip and a large gash above his eye and bruising on the side of his body that had been unaffected by the fall. But it's not enough to state definitively that he was bashed. Uh, sometimes it can be difficult if there's facial injuries from an assault and you also fall heavily onto your face, um, then naturally there may be an overlap with those injuries, but I, I didn't find anything that I was, I, I felt strongly about to indicate that he'd been assaulted and then pushed over the cliff. John had um, multiple injuries, and um, the thing is, whenever anyone falls from a, uh, a cliff at, at height, uh, yeah, that can mask any uh, uh, evidence of a physical assault. So, and you can't differentiate, well, that's from an assault, that's from the, uh, that's from the fall because it's all blunt force, uh, blood force injuries that he's, uh, that he's got. The police report notes that John was gay and the area is a gay beat where gangs have been known to bash homosexuals. But the report seems to ignore other evidence that may indicate this is not an accident, including the unusual position of the body. A body falling forward usually lands with the head facing away from the cliff. John has been found with his legs facing out to sea. That suggests he's been pushed backwards off the cliff. We know that bodies do bounce when they impact uh, with a hard surface, um, but I don't think that that would have been just enough to move the body quite a considerable distance from, say, head pointing outwards away from the cliff to 180 degrees pointing towards the cliff. Because it's pretty much a straight drop. Uh, there wasn't too much to bounce off on the way down, so how do you get that far out without either A, taking a running jump, and there wasn't room to do that, there was only a pathway and the edge, so there, it was either pushed or pushed or thrown. Another clue to suggest a struggle is the fact that John's jersey appears to have been forcibly pulled halfway up his torso, and, most damning of all, the crime scene photos clearly show a clump of hair stuck to John's hand. And I remember when I saw John in at Glee, he had the hairs. There's still there's photographs of him and he's still got the hairs in his hand, which made me immediately believe, well, he hasn't jumped because he's got someone's hair in his hand. The hairs looked somewhat different from the hairs of uh, John Russell's head, that, that were on John, John Russell's head. And nat naturally, of course, you, you're thinking about uh, involvement of another person or persons when that sort of thing um, does occur. Detective Page tries to locate the hair, but finds it's been lost. Another mystery is that there is no record that John's clothes were subjected to a thorough scientific examination. So we, don't, we still don't know if, 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 if such an examination was done or not. The Bondi police evidently washed all his clothes, <laughs> strangely enough, uh, and dressed up a dummy and put it out at the front of the police station with, um, it's in Wairau Avenue, uh, 
asking for anybody who may have seen anything or heard anything uh, to get in touch with the police. The coroner's inquest into John Russell's death lasts just 35 minutes. It concludes this was death by misadventure. This was um, a rather surprising conclusion at this time because there had been um, a number of um, bashings at the scene. Now, the, the fact that, Alco that uh, John had um, a high degree of alcohol in his system was a uh, reason enough, seemingly, for them to write off his, uh, his death as being accidental. Well, straight away I thought it was a load of rubbish. The police, as far as I knew, uh, were evidently trying to sweep the whole thing under the carpet because in those days, as you know, being gay was not permitted, you know, not accepted, not as it is today. Do I look like I'm killing you, dirty queer? Get out of here before I give you a flogging! And uh, having seen John's body uh, in the casket and uh, read the uh, coroner's report on the injuries that he'd sustained, there was just no doubt that he'd been flogged. You know an atrocious way, repeatedly, and probably then thrown over the cliff. It's now the winter of 1990 eight months since John Russell's death. Mm. You should have seen this guy as being a maddest dickhead, so Ken I just smacked the poof in the back of his head <laughs> and we just took all his shit. On Friday night, July 20th, on the path above Bondi Cliffs, three young thugs are smoking drugs and drinking. There, there was a bit of cash in there, we just split it up. But, like, there'll be more cash out here, that's why we're here. There, Matthew Davis, Sean McAuliffe, and his brother David. That's what we come out here for. This is where the good money is. The mood is angry. They're spoiling for a fight. Let's just smash these down and we'll go smash them. We should just finish these beers up, head out, find the first lot of them we see. Mm. Mm. Oh, they give me the shits, man. Oh. On nearby Campbell Parade, the main boulevard on Bondi Beach, 31-year-old Thai student Krichikorn Ratana Jurathaporn leaves the restaurant where he works as a dishwasher. He's only been in Australia four months, but as a gay man, he's already found more acceptance than in his home country. He got a job as a kitchen hand in Bondi to support himself, was living by himself in a, in a small apartment, but um, had decided that Australia was going to be the place where he would stay. His family um, didn't know about his sexuality. He kept it very firmly under wraps for obvious um, reasons when you come from a, from a sort of traditional kind of strict upbringing. Instead of going home to his small Bondi flat, he wanders up to the cliff tops where he meets another Hello. man, Geoffrey right. Sullivan. Been up here before? No, it's my first time. Do you live around here? I live in Bondi. I work in Bondi too. Oh. Yeah. Oh. The two are sitting on a rock ledge talking when they suddenly hear footsteps and see a gang of youths approaching. But they're trapped against the cliff. Use your jacket and your money! I'll kill you! Are you? Come on! Jeffrey is bashed with a claw hammer and falls to the ground, gushing blood. Sean McAuliffe jumps on his head and kicks him in the stomach, spleen and kidneys. Critchicorn breaks free and staggers down the path. But he's quickly caught and Sean McAuliffe then starts swinging his hammer. <laughs> Get a little fairy. <laughs> Go again. <laughs> Give him another one. 
<laughs> These Asian homos are tough little pricks. <laughs> Bleeding I'll and dazed, Krichikorn staggers away towards the cliff and then sees Matthew Davis approaching him oh, with a yeah. stick. Jeff Sullivan is left still breathing and gravely injured. He will lie unconscious on the path until the next morning when he'll be found by tourists. And soon afterwards, in the sea below, police divers will locate Krichikorn's mangled body. It was an uh, incredibly vicious attack. It's, um, it's hard to imagine outside of watching a horror film the scale of this, these kind of injuries that that uh, a, human, a human being takes from being systematically um, hit with a, with a claw hammer and being dragged along rocks and bashed against rock faces and so forth. Krichikorn, Ratana Gerathaporn's injuries were absolutely um, horrendous. This time, no one could dismiss the case as an accident. This time, there was blood and a survivor to bear witness to this merciless killing. A month later, the three killers are arrested after they're overheard by a friend's mother boasting about bashing a Chinaman. She overheard this conversation between them and her son. She had read the story in the newspapers at the time. She put two and two together and called the police. The McAuliffe brothers and Matthew Davis are tried and convicted. The brothers are sentenced to a minimum of 12 years in jail and Davis gets a minimum of 11. Detective Page now moves on to the story told by another survivor of another attack at the clifftops around the same time. He's a local Bondi restaurant waiter who's able to tell police exactly how his attackers dragged him towards the cliff. One of them had a stick. He recounts his absolute terror when he heard a voice saying, let's throw him off where we threw the other one off. I just ran. He was crying. He was screaming for help. There's units nearby, and a resident of a, um, a nearby unit came out on their balcony and screamed out words to the effect of, we don't help poofters. I heard the voice and seen the light come on, but that was all. The victim later attends Waverley Police Station and from file mugshots picks out the man he alleges was the ringleader in the attack. The face he allegedly identified is that of Sean Lee Cushman, a violent local thug with a string of offences to his name. Cushman is well known to police as the leader of a gang calling themselves the Bondi Boys. A month after being accused of that attack, Sean Lee Cushman is arrested with two others over yet another gay bashing at Bondi. But with insufficient evidence, he's released without charge, as is one of his alleged accomplices, David McAuliffe. The same David McAuliffe, who just seven months later will be convicted with his brother of Krichikorn's murder. Sean Cushman will later make headlines when he's sentenced to a good behaviour bond after aiding and abetting a fellow thug, Aaron Martin, in the notorious bashing death of British tourist Brian Hagland in a Bondi street. Page now wants to know, do Sean Cushman, David McAuliffe, or the gang members who followed them know something about what happened to Ross Warren? As he compiles details of more and more attacks on gay men, Detective Steve Page is now realising the full horror of what he's uncovering. So he started joining the dots. And when he started joining the dots, he was smelling something that um, was uh, the stuff of a, of a major investigation. Go on there, Matty. 
Go get the little princess. <laughs> It's now clear to Paige that in the late 1980s and early 1990s, a bloody gay hate bashing and murder spree had taken place across inner Sydney. January 1987. 43-year-old technician Raymond Keem is bashed to death in Allison Park, Randwick. The murder is unsolved. December 1988. Former school teacher William Allen is bashed and stabbed with a screwdriver in Alexandria Park. The murder is unsolved. January 1990, office worker Richard Johnson is bashed to death by a gang of eight at Alexandria Park. Three youths are convicted of murder and five of manslaughter. May 1990, school teacher Wayne Tonks was murdered in his flat. Teenagers Ben Andrew and Peter Kane were later convicted of the killing. April 1991. Ballet technician Morris John McCarty is bashed to death in his Newtown home. 19-year-old Christopher McKinnon is convicted of the murder, and despite boasting to friends he's just rolled a fag, he is acquitted on appeal using the controversial homosexual advance panic defence. August 1992, the body of 58-year-old Clark Cyril Olson is found washed up at Rushcutters Bay on Sydney Harbour. The murder is unsolved. So it was horrendous um, um, and very, very violent, um, you know, against gays back in, uh, back in that era. And with the, uh, the violence with, um, against gays, it wasn't one-on-one. -on -one. We were talking, you know, the, the victims were um, often on their own, at, at best too, but they were up against a, um, you know, a, a gang and these, uh, these, these uh, offenders. Cowardly attacks, often with, uh, often with weapons and no remorse, and it was just an absolute blood sport. After many months of compiling all the evidence, the detective now realises it will take a major task force to fully investigate Ross Warren's disappearance and the death of John Russell. First, he must convince his superiors to provide the resources needed to reopen cases, which are not only 10 years old, but are not even officially designated as murders. In the case of Ross Warren, he doesn't even have a body. One thing I looked at with Ross Warren was why his body didn't, um, didn't reappear. You know, if it's gone into the ocean, why wasn't it washed up? If somebody drowns close to the beach, yes, you'll, you, the body will probably come back to shore, but, but once you're seaward, it's very, very difficult. And um, I think bodies will resurface eventually, and that's often when they're found. But uh, if they're stuck along the coastline rocks, they can get trapped and, and, and might not come up at all. In the end, it's not the Ross Warren case, but evidence from the John Russell death that gets the wider investigation approved. And what got me over the line was speaking with a forensic pathologist, Alan Carla. I, um, I spoke with him, I gave him photographs of, um, of the John Russell um, crime scene, and he was of the same view as myself that um, John Russell didn't go off that cliff forwards. It was a uh, backwards motion fall off the, um, off the cliff. Um, I believe that uh, there were good indicators that foul play had occurred with uh, involving John Russell's death. Um, that it didn't look like uh, a straightforward suicide by jumping from a, from a height. Uh, and that uh, there were elements of foul play that needed to be further explored. Page is given the go-ahead to set up Operation Taradale. As well as a full team of detectives, he's allowed to call on the wider powers of the state's top crime-fighting body. And what I did also put forward a, um, a case to the New South Wales Crime Commission. And the Crime Commission is a, um, is a, a secret body. It's, um, it's got coercive powers. It's got a lot of um, investigative support that it can, uh, that it can offer, offer police. And I, uh, I, I needed to tap into that with what I, uh, with what I planned. 
A key to the investigation is a sworn statement given by one of Critchikorn's killers, Matthew Davis. Davis had confessed that he and the McAuliffe's had bashed at least a dozen other gay men at inner Sydney parks. Davis had also revealed the brothers had boasted of bashing and throwing another gay man to his death from the Bondi Cliffs. Page knows there must be more witnesses to be found, others who'd been attacked, but who had not reported it at the time. He decides to ramp up the publicity and attract TV news coverage of the investigation by staging a reenactment of John Russell's fall. We had a, um, a dummy that was thrown um, off the cliff and it was filmed and hit uh, mainstream, uh, mainstream media. Okay, go. Today, an unusual reenactment. Police using a dummy to help them work out did he jump or was he pushed? Police now suspect the death and Ross Warren's disappearance can be linked and that both were victimised for being gay. Looking at uh, doing the reenactment, we're hoping to bring witnesses forward. Now, what we had um, instead of, uh, well, we got witnesses, but we also got a, um, another deceased. One witness comes forward to tell Page about the sudden and mysterious disappearance in 1985 of Gilles Mattiani, a gay Frenchman living in Sydney who often walked along the cliffs at Bondi. Although it's some years earlier, Page adds Mattiani to the list. Other witnesses come forward to outline attacks they've suffered and slowly, inexorably, Page believes he can piece together what must have happened to Ross Warren on the clifftops at Bondi that night. As he arrived at Mark's Park, Ross is confronted by a pack of vicious young men. What are you doing here, you poofter? Set for a walk. Oh, mate. yeah, yeah, yeah. Give yeah, us your yeah. wallet. I don't have yeah. any money. Hello, honey. Come on, mate. Come on, mate. Give us Come on, mate. Grab it. Bag it. Come on, you big Put him on the ground. Put him on the ground. Bag it. Come on. And then comes the attack. Like many gay bashings, it lasts a long time. For this is not a simple robbery. This is blood sport, where the aim is to vent hatred, to punish and inflict pain. See this face before. Get him over the cliff. Get him up. Come on. Come on. Get his leg. Come on. Uh Get him over here. Yeah, it's what? Danny, stop him. Yeah. Okay. Alright, let's get him off. Uh, uh, see ya. Oh, shit. Glasses left his keys here. You've been in these, gorgeous. Let's get out of here. Ross's friends will later find his keys tucked in a rock cavity under a ledge, possibly left there by a passing tourist or fisherman who picked them up and placed them clear of the water. Now that a clear picture has emerged of the terrible wave of murders and bashings of gay men that had been occurring across inner Sydney 10 years earlier, the next step is to track down the culprits. 
Page's team then began interviewing more than 30 persons of interest, including members of the gang convicted of killing technician Richard Johnson in Alexandria Park. One, Adam French, had been secretly recorded in prison, boasting about throwing gay men off the cliffs at Bondi. But he refused to be interviewed or to cooperate with Taradale detectives. Two others convicted of the Johnson killing, Mark Church and Ron Morgan, denied taking part in any other attacks. Neither Adam French nor Mark Church or Ron Morgan have been charged with any of the Bondi murders. Various members of other gangs on legal advice refused to be interviewed and those who would talk all vehemently denied being involved in any of the attacks. After three years of digging, Page and his team had compiled an impressive brief for the coroner. Operation Taradale compiled more than 3,000 pages of witness testimonies, surveillance, phone tap transcripts and police reports. The inquest opened in March 2003 before Deputy New South Wales Coroner Jacqueline Millage and lasted six months. The various former gang members filed through the witness box and repeated their denials of any involvement in the bashings and killings. With no corroborating evidence, it was impossible so long after the crimes to be able to positively identify the murderers. When Millage handed down her findings, she praised Page's team for its work, but delivered a blistering broadside of criticism at the original investigating police. She described the earlier police work on the Warren case as grossly, quote, shameful, inadequate, and naive. She finds conclusively that Ross Warren and John Russell had both died as a result of foul play and described the gang members as cowardly and boastful brutes. They hunted in packs and their victims had little hope of defending themselves. Get him, put him on the ground. Come on, give it up, Paul. Oh, you're this uh, this investigation it was uh, it was big. It did take a uh, a long time, but it wasn't a uh, it wasn't a one man show. I had a team of uh, investigators that um, that worked with me um, as a as a group. Very uh, very proud. Certainly, I was uh, I was motivated trying to get the right results for the family. But um, yeah, we, you know, hopefully they uh, they fed off that. But they were an extremely uh, motivated group of uh, group of guys and girls, and uh, you know, I wouldn't have been able to achieve um, the brief of evidence without their support. The coroner is unable to say conclusively what happened to Giel Mattiani in 1985, but she says there is a strong possibility that he died in similar circumstances to the other men. Steve Page and his team are being hailed as heroes for finally showing what had happened to Ross Warren and John Russell. Meanwhile, the cases continue to be investigated because the killers still walk free amongst us and someone, somewhere, knows who they are. Do I look like I'm kidding your shirt lifter? Get out of here. Well, I just hope there's somebody out there brave enough and sensible enough to realise what the consequences of that group's actions that night um, and on many other occasions, uh, what impact it's had um, on people's lives, friends and family. I just hope that one of them can find it within themselves to come clean about it and uh, let us know who was responsible. I'm sure being 19 years down the track now, those people have got children. You know, and with any luck, their children will be gay. And then, how are they going to feel when, when their son comes home and says, look, Dad, I'm gay. What's he going to do? Grab him and throw him off a cliff? Get it out, I'll get him! Or is he going to sit down and he will play with his mind till the day he dies? I'm confident that sooner or later, that the people involved in this will have their, uh, will have their day in court. And I'm asking uh, any witnesses, uh, in the deaths of Ross Warren and John Russell to come forward now rather than you know, be a witness now as opposed to being a defendant further down the track. You don't, you don't really ever get over 
you put it away for a while, and then something happens. A birthday, Christmas, things like this show, uh, come along and out it comes again. It's like the, the box of everything that, that's over there. It hasn't been out now since 2005. It's not as simple as closing that box up and putting that back in the cupboard and saying, OK, well, that's it, it's gone away again. It doesn't. It stays. It stays for quite a while. Certainly from Ross's point of view, he had so much to give to the world and the fact that his sexuality was the reason why he was murdered is just horrific, just wrong in every conceivable level. And uh, the fact that somebody in our police force uh, kept going to make sure that he didn't die in vain, I think is really important. And that night he came back up and he waited to get my eye and it was obvious that, and I kept looking over at him and expecting him just to say, have a good weekend, you know, whatever. And he, and he stood there and I was aware of it and then I looked over and got his eye and he said goodbye. And that goodbye has haunted me. All these years. There's a very simple reason why the, all these young men were killed. It wasn't because they were um, uh, targets for robbery. It wasn't because they were involved with crime themselves. It wasn't because they were um, looking for trouble. They were killed because they were gay.